We're now going to look at module four, which in the book is sections three, one, and three, two. And the first topic to cover is function notation. Now, before I jump right into function notation, let me take a step back and try and lay the groundwork. Here's a very common equation. In this case, we have two variables. X and Y are the most commonly used. So Y equals 2X plus 3. Now, sometimes in math, they like to give these variables names. Matter of fact, X in this case, sometimes you'll see them call this the independent variable and then y over here I get to the e, is the dependent variable now these names are because one way of thinking about this is x is independent in the sense that we can sort of make x whatever number we want and in a minute we're going to do that. And then y is called the dependent variable because the value of y is determined by the value we choose for x. Or we say the value of y depends upon what value, what number we plug in for x. Now you probably learned years ago when you had these kinds of equations In other words, if we just want to keep it simple, so we can choose, let's just choose some numbers to plug in for x, our independent variable, and then see what y ends up being equal to. So if I set x equal to 0, then y is equal to 3. How about if I set x equal to 1? then y would equal 5. We can just do a few more. If x is 2, uh, y equals 7. And oftentimes, it's helpful to even choose negative numbers. If I set x equal to negative 1, y would be 1. <clears throat> if x is negative 2, y would equal negative 1. As a matter of fact, it's normally not very common to write it like this. Normally, as a sort of shortcut way, we do what's called the old XY table, sometimes called a T table. So in this case, you put all your values of X here. So when X is 0, Y is 3. <clears throat> when X is 1, Y is 5. X is 2, Y is 7. So I'm basically just copying what I did over here. But normally you just write this. You don't normally write it like this. Now if you recall, one of the things we can do with all these, we can think of these as ordered pairs. We're an ordered pair. It's like two numbers inside of a parenthesis separated by a comma. And the first number represents the value of x, and the second number represents the value of y. So this one would end up being 0, 3, then 1, 5, and then 2, 7, negative 1, 1, negative 2, negative 1. And then finally, what we did, what you did in the past, and which we're going to also do this soon is create a graph out of this. So really in a sense what we're doing, we're really graphing this equation. But one of the ways, there's, there's other ways to graph this equation. But one of the ways, and probably the first way you learned years ago, is to just get your points and plot your points. So if I just do a rough sketch of this graph, 
So once again, the vertical up and down is the y-axis, the horizontal is the x-axis, and of course in the center, x and y are both zero. And I think all of you have probably graphed in the past, so you sort of know how this works. So if I graph these points, this first point, x0, y3, so my x-axis go to 0 and move up to 3. So there's 0, 3, and then 1, 5. 3, 4, 5, 1, 5, and then 2, 7. Actually, I'm going to skip 2, 7 because I'm sort of running out of room. Let me do these other points. Negative 1, 1 is right here. And negative 2, negative 1. So as it turns out, I've plotted these four points. And in this case, since this is a linear equation, when I graph it, it is going to be a straight line. So, of course, I can connect. And a lot of times you'll see them label the graph y equals 2x plus 3. In a sense, this line, this graph, represents this equation. Another way to think about it is this line represents all the solutions to this equation, all the points that work for this equation. In other words, I could choose any point on this line, and if I go get my value of x and find the value of y, and plug them into this equation, it'll work. I like to say that this line represents all the solutions of this equation. And in, our, and in this case, a solution are actually two values. You have to have an x and a y. All right, I say all that to now start talking about function notation. So function notation, let me start with our original equation. What they do is, the first thing they do is they replace, instead of writing y, let me just write it and I'll try and describe it to you. They replace y with this right here. And just so you know it, you could think of this as f times x. It's very common in algebra that when you have two things next to each other, that means multiplication. But that's not what this means here. We're not multiplying f and x. First of all, f is not even really a variable. This is called function notation. Matter of fact, there's a certain way to pronounce it. You would pronounce this f of x. So if I were to describe this equation to someone, I would say f of x equals 2x plus 3. We basically simply replace the y with this f of x. And you're going to see, as we do more and more of these kinds of problems, it's very common to think about the idea of replacing y and f of x, even going back and forth. y and f of x really are the same thing. It's just a different way of expressing it. When I see this function notation f of x, in a sense, the variable inside the parenthesis is going to be the variable that's in my equation. It's almost like sometimes I like to think of function notation as they're saying here's a function or here's an equation, and we're going to call it f, function f. And this function, or this equation, is going to have the variable x in it. And that's the only variable it's going to have in it. Whatever variable is inside the parenthesis here, that's the variable inside the equation. I could have another function.
f of x equals 5x squared minus 2x plus 1. Now, just so you know, f of x by far is the most common type of function. But it's not the only function notation we can use. Someone could, if they wanted to, they could have a function g of x. g of x equals x squared minus 16. Once again, this function notation says, okay, here's an equation, or here's a function, and it's going to have the variable x in it, and only the variable x, and we call it g of x. And you can even get to the point where sometimes, oftentimes, the variable is not x. I mean, x is the most common variable, and f of x is the most common function notation, but it doesn't have to be. Later on, there's going to be some story problems. I think you'll probably have to do it. It's very common in this kind of class where you have some kind of someone that throws a ball straight up into the air. And of course, the ball comes down. So if we think of this We think of the flight of the ball as sort of going on a graph. But what we're going to do here is we're going to call the y-axis. We're not going to call it y. We're going to call it h for height. And this axis we're going to call t for time. So here's the flight of the ball. As the time is increasing, the ball is going up and the ball comes down. For this, we will oftentimes have the function h of t. Maybe it looks like this. I'm just making this up. So what do we have here? We have a function. You can really think of this. It wouldn't be totally incorrect if you wanted to just write this. just to understand it and not write the function notation. It's almost like h, the height, is equal to this equation with the variable t. But normally we write it in function notation. h of t equals this. So I showed you that just to show you that function notation, for the most part, a lot of our examples, maybe most of our examples are f of x, but it doesn't have to be f of x. The function name can change g of x, but even the variable can change, h of t. All right, so what did we do with this function notation? Let's go back to my earlier example. And I said way back at the start of this little talk here, I said one of the things we can do is, since x is my independent variable, I can just say, well, if we set x equal to 3, then y is going to be 9. However, let's take the same equation and let's rewrite it in function notation. Whenever you take an equation and re rewrite it in function notation, all you're doing is you're placing the y with f of x. Now here's where function notation can be sort of handy or I guess you could say clever or it's almost like a shortcut. What if I want to go ahead and see what the value of my function is? And that's the way I word it. Up here I say, what's the value of y when I plug in 3 for x? Here I would say, what's the value of the function? value of function when x equals 3. The way I can write that is simply write 
f of 3. What f of 3 means, you go back to your function, and inside your function, or inside the equation, what this tells me is every place I have an x, I replace it with the number 3. So if f of x equals 2x plus 3, f of 3 equals 2 times 3 plus 3. In other words, I put a 3 in for x here. And f of 3 equals 9, which is actually the same thing I got up here. So in a sense, what I'm doing, I'm plugging in 3 for x and finding the value of the function, which actually is the same value of y. I could say f of negative 1. So what that says is, go your function, go your equation, every place you have an x, replace it with a minus 1. So 2 times minus 1, which is x, plus 3, should be 1. So f of 1 equals 1. And sometimes we don't even necessarily have to use numbers. What if I said determine f of a? Even though there's not a number inside my function notation, the same principle applies. What this, saying is, what this is saying is, go get your function, and every place you have an x, replace it with a. So instead of replacing it with a number, let's replace it with a. So 2x plus 3, 2 times x, but if I replace x with an a, 2a plus 3. So you're going to have some homework problems where they will give you a function and then they will have you set x equal to a number and determine the function and they will also have you set x equal to a variable. Now as a takeoff on that, here's a very, very famous sort of math equation. Let's first start with a function about f of x equals x squared minus 9. One of the most famous equations in math And if you take calculus ever in the future, you will definitely see this. It's called the difference quotient. The difference quotient is like a formula. And what it is, it's f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Now we're going to actually figure out the difference quotient, but before we do that, whoops, sorry, oh boy, so here's this difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x, that whole thing over h. But before we apply that to our function here, let's just take a minute, this is very simple. Let's take a quick minute look at what I call math with functions. That means you have multiple functions and you're performing math. For instance, f of x equals x squared minus 4. g of x equals 2x squared minus 
2x plus 3. Math with functions means just the usual addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Sometimes you have things like this. Where they give you f of x and g of x, and they want you to add these together. Well, you simply write your f of x, and then you write the g of x. And now you just combine like terms, right? x squared and 2x squared, 3x squared, negative 2x, there's no other term with x in it, and then 4 plus 3. Okay, so when you add the two functions together, you get this. How about, this can be a little trickier. You have to be careful if you're subtracting. So f of x is x squared minus 4. In fact, I'm going to put this in parentheses. Minus, just to make sure I don't make any mistakes, I'm going to subtract and in parentheses put my g of x. 2x squared minus 2x plus 3. And now I'm going to combine like terms. But the first step is, hopefully you see, I have to be very careful. I'm subtracting all the terms inside the parentheses. So if I get rid of the parentheses, I'd have minus 2x squared. Then you subtract a negative, means plus 2x minus 3. And now you combine like terms. x squared minus 2x squared minus x squared. I only have one x term. And then minus 4 minus 3 minus 7. So this ends up being... And I'm not going to show you, but oops. You can multiply, which hopefully you all know how to multiply. This would be sort of messy, but I'm not going to do it now. So I don't think you need help with that. And then also you can do division, although you don't normally do division, you just write it as a fraction and leave it. So the basic math function, math operations with functions is very straightforward. I did all that because now, a few minutes ago, we were talking about calculating this difference quotient. And up here, it's like I'm subtracting these two functions. So I just wanted to be aware of that. So let's go through this again now. So here's a function I'm going to look at. And I'm going to calculate the difference quotient. The difference quotient is like a formula. F of x plus h. What's that mean? That means I have to go get my f function. And every place there's an x, I replace the x with x plus h. I replace the x with that whole thing, x plus h. Once I do that, I'm going to subtract f of x, my original equation. Then I take that and divide it by h. So let's go ahead and try and calculate the difference quotient if I'm using this function. f of x plus h. That means you go to your f function. Every place you have an x, you replace it with x plus h. So I think I should have x plus h squared minus 9. Right? Simply take the f function, replace the x with x plus h, then I subtract, just 
put this parentheses to make make sure I remember to apply the negative to everything. Subtract f of x. Well, f of x is just my original equation or function. And all that is over h. <clears throat> now in the numerator, let's go and simplify. Matter of fact, I have to multiply x plus h times x plus h. I have to do a FOIL on this. And then here, I need to get rid of the parentheses by distributing the minus. So when I do all that, I believe I should have x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, then minus 9. And then minus this stuff, which is minus x, x, x squared plus 9, all that over 0. If I combine like terms, it's interesting, x squared and minus x squared cancel out. So I have 2xh. Oh, yeah. The x squareds cancel out, so I have 2xh. And then actually the 9s, minus 9 and plus 9 cancel out. Actually, the thing I'm left with is plus h squared. Just to make it clearer. So in this case, the difference quotient equals 2xh plus h squared. All right, so that's a very, very, very common kind of problem I like to give you when working on function notation. Oh, sorry. Wow. All right, let me stop here since I forgot. I gotta keep an eye on this. So difference quotient, f of x plus h, every place I have an x, replace it with x plus h. So this right here is the f of x plus h. This right here, so that's the f of x plus h. Here's the f of x. You just have the h in the bottom. By the time you simplify things, a lot of things cancel out. Wow. This whole thing's over h. So this thing's over h. So actually, since I have an H in both terms here, I can cancel an H out of all three of these. And there's your difference quotient, 2x plus H. All right, sorry about going off the screen and forgetting this H here. So anyway, not too difficult once you see it. So this is all sort of function notation. Now I'm going to take a break and going to go to the next um, video and we're going to talk about um, something called the domain and then we're going to start looking at graphing these functions and how that all works.